If you would, we're going to pray as we get into God's Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive it. Thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated, if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of the work of God in the redemptive plan that has brought forth the redemption of mankind. It's partially completed. There's more that is going to be done, as you will see as we go through this series of messages on the subject of redemption. The last time together, we talked about from the creation up to the time of the flood. We're going to review some of that for many of you that were not here and move on from there. We talked about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Heaven is actually plural, the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, void, darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then he began to bring forth the creation, speaking it into being, one statement after another. One thing that we pointed out that has been a great error in the body of Christ is those people who have believed that there is a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. It's called the gap theory, that there was a time when everything was destroyed and God had to do a redo of the earth. It is a lying teaching from the devil the doctrine of the devil. First of all, we need to realize that this particular phrase here, which in the Hebrew, Bereshith, which means beginning, bara, which means created, and then Elohim, this is in, for those of you who know Hebrew, it's in the construct state, it's not absolute, otherwise it would be a different word, and that's critical because the construct state in the Hebrew means it's an action in progress, not a completed act. And this is a relative clause in a sentence that reveals an action in progress, not a completed statement. This is actually a statement that is a prepositional phrase because it begins with in here, and that's a prepositional phrase. And then it goes to verse 2, and here we see three that are circumstantial clauses that are brought forth. These are all clauses. And when we come to verse 3, that's where we see the main subject and verb in the statement, where here, God said. That is what we see that comes forth. So we see that there is a relative clause to begin with, then three circumstantial clauses, and then the statement of what he has said he did. And essentially what it says is this. In the beginning of God's preparing or creating of the heavens and the earth, because this is what it's talking about he was doing. The earth was not formed, it was unformed. It was empty, it wasn't filled with anything. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved, or was fluttering over, to bring something into being upon the face of the waters, and then God said to bring in the creation. In other words, there is no gap between verse 1 and verse 2. This is where the creation started and he brought forth light by speaking this into being. This is important because people have been deceived about the creation. They've thought there were millions of years in between, which is a big lie. No way. Not the truth at all. God brought forth the creation, brought it into being as he spoke it into being, and we know that as he brought it into being that the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, that with God the evening is the beginning of the day from his standpoint. We also talked about the fact that as he brought forth this creation, it says, he, let there be a firmament. This means an expanse between, in the, in the midst of the waters. There were waters, and he brought an expanse in those waters, separating them. And it said it divided the waters from the waters. He had divided the waters that were under the, the expanse from the waters that were above this expanse. And so, that means there's waters above and there's waters below. And then what did he do? He began to bring forth the creation of the earth and the seas. He said, the waters under the heaven were gathered together to one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So we see we have the earth, the dry land, and we have the seas, the waters. These are the ones that were gathered together underneath. And he continued on with the creation of all the different things, the vegetation, the animals, and fish, and fowls of the air, 
<clears throat> we come down to verse 26. God said, let us, the plural pronoun showing the plurality of the Godhead, make man in our, again a plural pronoun, image, after our likeness, in the very likeness or similitude of God. And he said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God gave man dominion over the earth. And we talked about the fact that the purpose for why God brought this all into being is because he wanted to have a family. We see over in Ephesians that God desired to have a family. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15, where it says, Of the whole family in heaven and earth is named. As a family that God wanted. And so he created man in his very image in order to have a family. Male and female, he created them. That was the summary of, how he, of what he had created. Now, we must also understand that in placing man in the earth, in Psalms 24, verse 1, we see that the earth is the Lord's. It belongs to him. And the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell therein. At the same time, he gave the earth into the hands of man. We see in Psalms 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. He retained that. But the earth hath he given to the children, or the sons, more literally, of men. He gave it to them. But he's still the owner of it. So, and he given it, gave it to him. How did he, what, in what manner or what form did he give it to him and for, for what reason? It was a lease. It wasn't given to him that he could just do what he wanted forever. It was a lease for a period of time where he had authority in the earth. This is revealed in Luke chapter 20, verse 9, when he says, Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and let it forth to husbandmen and went to a far country for a long time. The word let here is the word that means a lease where he lets something out for hire like you let something out. It's a lease. He gave the earth as a lease to man. And that was for him to have dominion for a period of time. We see that there were seven days of creation. The six days he created things. The seventh day is the day that he rested. This typifies the 7,000 years of Earth's existence. We see over in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Each day it points towards the thousand year period. The seven days are the 7,000 year period of the Earth's existence. The six days was the 6,000 years of man's lease. And the last one, the thousand year period, is where God is going to rule and reign for a thousand years. We know that because this is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We pointed this out pointed out again. Many people try to say, well, is this really a thousand years? It sure is. Five verses in Revelation 20, he makes it very clear he's talking about a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 2, laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. The next verse talks about he was shut up and could not deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. The next verse, where he speaks of those who lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's what we're going to be doing in the millennial reign. Amen. Verse 5, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. All the unrighteous dead will stay dead in hell for a thousand years. The first resurrection are the ones who are going to be with the Lord, of course. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power or no authority, this means but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. 6,000 years is the time of the lease the man had on the earth. Now when God 
had made man. We talked about the fact that he set him in the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The word keep means to guard. Why was he going to need to guard it? Because God, in his foreknowledge, knew what was going to be happening, which was the fall of the angels in heaven. We get with Lucifer and the one-third of the angels that followed him. Had this happened yet? No. How do we know that? Because here's when he put man in the Garden of Eden. We see in Ezekiel, chapter 28, when it's speaking about Lucifer who fell when he was sin, it sinned. We go back to verse 13. Speaking of him, it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. He was there. Every precious stone was thy covering, because he, he was a very beautiful, had a be beautiful creature. A sar sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold. He, had all, he was a beautiful creature. This is before the fall, and he was there in Eden. He'd seen what had gone on. The workmanship of thy tabrets. Tabrets means timbrels and tambourine. He was the leader of the praise and worship. This is rhythm instruments. And the pipes, which refers to instruments, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. In other words, rhythm and instruments were in Lucifer. He was the leader of the praise and the worship in heaven. Well, what happened to him? We see over in Isaiah, first of all, Chapter 14, here we see in verse 12 and following, he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? He was Lucifer, the light bearer, who was the leader of the praise and worship in heaven, but not anymore. He fell from heaven. Why was that? Because he wanted to be like God. He said in thy heart, I will send into heaven, I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God, I'll sit also among the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north, I'll send above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Who already was also like the Most High? Man was made in the likeness. This is a similar word, just a little bit different, the likeness or resembling. He, wanted, he was jealous. The angels were jealous of the fact that man was made in the very image of God, in the likeness of God. And he'd been down there and seen the garden, seen what had happened. And they didn't like it one bit. And when he went back up to heaven, he led a rebellion against God. And in that rebellion, of course, God discovered the sin in his life. We see this declared in Ezekiel 28. Verse 14, speaking of him, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, the leader of the praise and worship in heaven. I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Angels are created beings in a different order. Till iniquity was found in thee. Iniquity means unrighteousness. Ah, that means he sinned. God didn't make that. He was perfect in his ways. He's the one who sinned in unrighteousness against God. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned because of that. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. He was cast out, and that was the end of him being the leader in the praise and worship. And his name was changed from Lucifer to Satan, which means the adversary. At the same time, we saw and mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, it reveals that there were one-third of the angels that followed after him. It speaks of, in verse 4 of Revelation 12, the tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. The third part, that's talking about the angels. And the dragon stood before the woman, ready to be delivered, to devour a child. This is talking about when he was after he was the dragon, he was the serpent. He was Satan at this point in time. And we know that there, the angels had fallen as well, one-third of them. Because 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says, 
If God spared not the angels that sinned, plural, that sinned, it wasn't just Lucifer, it was the ones that followed him in the rebellion against God because of the jealous of man. He cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. The chains of darkness is not physical change, it's a state of being in darkness where they could never come to the light. There is no reconciliation for angels. They're done. They, the fallen angels, they are, their judgment is set. We see a similar statement that we looked at, Jude, that is. Verse 6, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, what a mistake. He hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness. They never can come to the light. There is no reconciliation for angels unto the judgment of the great day. Well, we saw after the fall, remember God had told man that he was to guard the garden. Well, that meant, in God's, of course, foreknowledge, there'd be someone coming who would be an evil one, and that's exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, the serpent, more subtle than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. The devil came through the serpent, and he said to the woman, Has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the free, tr fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Was that the truth? No. What tree was in the midst of the garden? The tree that was in the midst of the garden, as we see in Genesis 2, 9, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. They were supposed to partake of that, as well as the other trees. <laughs> well, that was, she, what, she didn't have things straight whatsoever. And she also said you couldn't touch it. Remember? Said, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat of it, for in the day you eat it thereof, you'll surely die, God said. He didn't say anything about not touching it. And he also said, in the day you eat it, you shall this isn't just one word, die. There's two words for die here. It literally says, in dying, you shall die. The dying that occurred first was the spiritual death, immediately. Amen. And the result was, you shall die, which was the physical death, as, as he lived for what, 930 years after that, where he died. Genesis 5, 5 indicates that. So, the woman didn't have the word of God in her. And so she was easily deceived. Well, we come down to verse 6. Here's where the woman saw the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. What a mistake. In fact, <clears throat> she had told him to that too. It didn't say it right there, but it says it down here. Unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice, of thy wife. So she told him, here, eat this. And it's eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse the ground for thy sake and sorrow. You eat of it all the days of thy life. And of course, because man partook of it, he knew it, what he was doing. The woman was deceived, but the man was not, it says in 1 Timothy 2.14, we saw. Therefore, now that he had disobeyed God and he spiritually died immediately, separated from God, what was the result of that? He no longer was in relationship with God. He was spiritually dead. And in doing so, he transferred the authority that God had given unto him into the hands of the enemy, Satan, because he submitted to Satan. This is clearly revealed. These are some of the things we brought forth before, but we want to bring them out to you again. This is in the temptation in Luke chapter 4 where the devil said to him, Jesus, all this authority, not power, it's the word exousia that means authority. The word power is dunamis in the Greek. This is exousia meaning authority. Young's corrects the King James error. All this authority will I give thee in the glory of them, talking about the kingdoms, for that is delivered unto me. It's been given into my hands, is what that means. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Jesus didn't dispute that statement whatsoever. Of course, here's the temptation, all be yours if you just fall down and worship me. And of course, Jesus dealt with the temptation, you shall worship the Lord thy God only, and him only shalt thou serve. 
But the point is, it was delivered unto him because the authority was given into the hands of Satan. Not only became he the god of this age and the god of the world, the ruler over the world system, but also he became the spiritual father of mankind. We see this revealed in John chapter 8, verse 44. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father he'll do. He's speaking to the religious people. It says that's who their spiritual father is. So he now is the spiritual father of mankind. What's the situation? Satan now is in authority over the earth. He's got this lease now for 6,000 years to rule and reign in the earth. Man's spiritually dead, separated from God. And we see, of course, the earth is now cursed and is going to be doomed for it to be uh, burned up in the end. And we see the fact that God doesn't have any relationship, of course, with man at that point. And now man is in spiritual darkness under dominion of Satan. Well, God had a plan, of course. His plan was a hidden plan from the very foundation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the, not world, it's the word aeon, before the ages. It's also plural because there's many different ages that are referred. This is the word for age in the Greek. It's plural. That's why it should be translated, as Young's brings out, ages. God ordained before the ages. He set this before the ages. And Paul got the revelation of all this, see? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. He said that how the by revelation he made known unto me, it was revealed to him, the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this is a mystery that was hidden in God of the plan that God had to bring forth what he purposed. And that was to bring forth a family. And he's going to have a real family, but it's going to be a righteous family. It was going to be a holy family. Well, now that this had happened, what was needed to be done? We see in Genesis chapter 3, God spoke something to Satan. This is to the serpent. He said in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Who's thy seed? That's all of mankind. He's the father of mankind. Everybody who's spiritually dead, now under Satan's dominion. And then it says her seed. Does the woman have the seed? No, the man has the seed. Well, this is talking about a woman, though meaning that the woman was going to get seed from some source, and it wasn't going to come from a fallen man. It was going to come from God, prophetic of the virgin birth, because it was only God was the only one who could accomplish the redemption. It shall bruise, crush the lordship of, of his headship, bruise and crush his headship, while you shall bruise his heels, speaking the fact that he would go through the crucifixion. Now, Satan didn't understand any of these things. He didn't know these things. In fact, if he would have known it, he would have never crucified him on the cross. We see that after we looked at about the wisdom hidden. Verse 8, none of the rulers, princes means rulers, none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known it, if they'd have known about this wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory because it was the means whereby he was able to accomplish all the things that needed to be, be done. And there were many things that needed to be done, as you will see as we go through this series. Now, as God had created man, he gave man directions, of course, what they were to do, and to begin to <clears throat> follow the way of the Lord. Unfortunately, there's only a few that followed the way of the Lord, and that was the sons of God line, as opposed to the sons of men. They're the ones who rebelled against God and would not follow his way. We know that Abel, who was 
obedient and of the sons of God line obeyed what God told them to do, while Cain did not. And Cain, of course, rose up and killed him. But after that, God did have his righteous line that was going to go, and this seed, remember, so this means there's a, a seed line that's going to come, that's going to come with the, with the one who's going to be accomplishing this breaking of his lordship, his headship over mankind. And who was that? That was going to be Jesus, who was God in Christ, coming to reconcile in the wor world unto himself. Well, here he says in verse 25, God, she said, has appointed me another seed. This is Seth, instead of Abel, whom God slew. And so Seth continued on the line of the sons of God. And he continued on until it got to the place where Noah was the one, and things degenerated in the world. Men continued to rebel against God. There was all, but the sons of God line continued until we come to the place where man was in so bad a shape that God was going to do something about it. He was so wicked, he was going to destroy all of mankind. Men were come to the place of everything was just so, they weren't following the way of the Lord anymore. It says in Genesis 6, 1, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. The sons of God, they were the ones that were following the line of God, saw the daughters of men uh, those were the women that were not following the way of God. That they were fair, uh, they were good looking, uh, beautiful, and they took them wives of all that they chose. Mm, that was a mistake. They, weren't, they were supposed to take godly ones, not just what the lookers as they chose to do. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. You don't understand what this is said in the King James because there's some things that are left out here, unfortunately. When it says, for he also is flesh, there's not just one Hebrew word here. There is a second Hebrew word here, and it's shown here in this tremendous program. It is the word here, shagog, which means to go astray, to err. Talking about man erring. Young's literal that we have, we always put it up because it corrects the King James errors and brings forth things that were left out or mistakenly put in in the King James. It says, in their erring, their flesh. So here he's saying, I'm not going to strive. My spirit doesn't strive in man to the age, is what it's talking about. In their erring, their flesh. And that's because man wasn't so bad. Now, he makes another statement after this, and people have not understood this. It says here, his days will be 120 years. Is that the length of man's life? No. He's not talking about that. How do we know? And we gave this before, without going to all these scriptures again. It's on the last message. You can hear it. But Abraham lived 175 years. That's not 120. Ishmael was 130 years. Isaac was 180 years. And Jacob was 130 years. So this can't be talking about the lifespan of man. It's not. What is he talking about? He's talking about the days that man was given to rule the earth, the lease, for 6,000 years. Because what are these 120 years? These are jubilee years. Jubilee years. Jubilee is 50 years. 120 jubilee years is 6,000 years. That is what he's talking about. And that was the time that God had given unto man the 6,000 years that he was able to, to have dominion. And now Satan had it, remember. And here, man is not following the way of the Lord. Now he's down to the place where everybody's evil. He decides to destroy the whole group. There were giants in the earth in those days, we pointed out. The giants were those who were the fallen ones, and one, well, the fallen was because of the accumulation of sin. You fall because of sin, is what it's talking about. Giants are somewhat misleading, as we saw when we looked at the theological word book of Old Testament information, where it really means mighty, fierce warriors. Mighty, fierce warriors. <clears throat> They were mighty fierce warriors in the earth. This was the giants was put in the LXX, which is the Septuagint translation, which is not an accurate translation. There's lots of problems in it. It's a translation of the Old Testament into Greek. 
but not exactly from the Hebrew in all cases. They threw that in there. And also after that, when the sons of God, as are the ones that were following the way of the Lord, came in under the daughters of men, those are the ones they had no business being with, what happened? They bare children to them, the same became mighty men. This is not talking about fallen angels mating with women as people have taught, which is a lying doctrine of the devil. It's totally false. This is talking about men. These are those who were old men, mortal men. These were ones that were carrying on the destructive work. Everything got worse and worse in the earth. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He's that bad. And so he says, It repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and grieved him in his heart. He said, I'm going to destroy man. He's going to destroy everything, as we see, because he repented that he had made them all. But there was one man of the sons of God line who was following the way of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generation of Noah. He was a just man, a righteous man. He was perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. He followed the way of the Lord. He obeyed the Lord, it says in chapter 7, verse 1, where he said, I have seen the righteous before me. He had been obeying all the commandments, doing everything that God had told him to do. So, because of that, Noah was going to be spared. Everything else was going to be destroyed. So, so he told Noah to make an ark, and him and all his house were to come into the ark because he'd seen him righteous before me. Remember, he's going to have a family, and the family he's going to have is going to be a righteous family. Well, we go back to chapter 6, and it's verse 12. When he looked upon the earth, behold, it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And he said, The end of all flesh has come before me. The earth's filled with violence. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The whole deal is going to be destroyed. So he told him to make an ark. But then in verse 18, he says something. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, thy wife and the sons' wives with thee. So he's going to make a covenant with him. And that covenant was that he would not destroy the earth again with a flood, which is what he was going to do at that time. So that's the way he began to deal with man. This is the first where he made a covenant with man. And after the flood began, at the end of the flood, we see something important. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. This is when the ark rested after the five months of the waters being on the earth. On the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat, the seventh month is significant because the seventh month in Hebrew, Hebrew month is Tishri. And this is the month of the fulfillment of the fall feasts of the Lord. There are seven feasts. We're going to begin to talk about those tonight. The first four have been fulfilled. We don't keep those anymore. They have been fulfilled. We proclaim the, the fulfillment of them. The last three have not been fulfilled and they will be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The seventh month is the time prophetically of the fulfillment of the work of God in the end time church. And what's especially important to know is the seventh month, but from somewhere between the 15th to the 21st day for sure, Jesus was born. He was born at Tabernacles. We know that. We've talked about that in the past. And we'll just give you one scripture that shows it. When the Word was made flesh, John 1, 14, and He dwelt among us. This is the word means to tabernacle. Jesus was born at the time of tabernacles. And we know it was after the time of the Day of Atonement because in Luke chapter 3, when He began His, when He was beginning His ministry, when He was the, the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was uh, descended on him in the, like a dove in which he, the father said, I, this, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. When was this? Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. He wasn't quite 30 years of age, but he was almost that. And when did this ministry start? It started on the seventh month, tenth day. 
which is the day of atonement when he began to, that's the day to start beginning to bring the judgment upon Satan and all the evil spirits. He was going to bring forth the judgment upon them to take back the authority, begin the a process of taking back the authority over the earth and to bring forth the redemption. Well, that means that he was born after the seventh month, tenth day. And he was born at the time of tabernacles. So, we go back to Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. On the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. Look at what the word Ararat means. It means the curse reversed. Meaning that God proclaimed when this ark, and the ark, remember, points towards later when we see the ark, the ark of the covenant, that's where the manifest presence of God is. This speaks here, the ark resting, coming to rest. Who would that be that would come, who would come to reverse the curse in the earth, who was born in the seventh month, and perhaps on the very 17th day, Jesus. Jesus come to bring forth the reversal of the curse upon the earth and to accomplish the redemption. Tremendous what he has accomplished. Now, we'll mention this at this point. The number 17 is a number that's important because the number 17 speaks of the number that is not only reversing of, of a curse, but also the reversing of evil, the stopping of evil. We even see this when we see in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, the 600th year of Noah's life in the seventh month, second month, the 17th day of the month, on the 17th day, that's when the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the window heavens, windows of heaven were open. That meant now the judgment was going to come to stop the evil. 17 is the number of bringing judgment and to stop the evil in the earth. And, of course, on the 17th day when the ark rested, on uh, Ararat, the, the curse to be reversed again to end the evil prophetic of Jesus coming and being born. We see other cases of this 17th, 17 number. Genesis 37, 2. Here, it speaks here about the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. 17, he's going to do something to be coming to have some effect of stopping evil. He was feeding the flock with his brother, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah and his father's wives. And Joseph brought him to father their evil report. He exposed the evil at the time when he was 17 years old. Jacob, who went into Egypt, you know, after he was 130 years old, he went into Egypt. How long was he in Egypt for? He lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. But that was no more than that, because that was a place of evil. Only 17 years in an evil land, that's when he died and he was brought out of that. His bones brought out of it. We see over in 1 Kings, chapter 14, verse 21. Here it's speaking about Rehoboam. He was an evil king here. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. This guy, they were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. That meant this is the time of evil reign. It stopped after 17 years. He only reigned that amount of time. We see again, this is pointing towards a period of evil. In 2 Kings 13, here we see the 23 and 20th year of Joash, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah. Joahaz, has, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Hamarion, reigned 17 years, and he did evil as well. Only 17 years, and it got stopped. It's also interesting about Ahaz, in 2 Kings 16.1, in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Ramallah, Ahaz, began to reign. And he, was not, he, did, he didn't do that was right in the sight of the Lord either. He was evil. And we see another thing, which we'll be looking at at a later time, but we want to bring to your attention. 
that in order to accomplish what Jesus needed to do, he had to take back control of the earth. And this is where in Jeremiah 32, verse 6, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And he told them that there was a field in Anathoth. Anathoth is a place of affliction. And he spoke of this one where the right of redemption is thine to buy it. It's a type of the church being in total affliction, total destruction because of the sin. But somebody could buy this particular place that was afflicted, and he was supposed to be doing this ahead of time for the Lord. The right of redemption is thine to buy it. And so, Hanamiel, God is gracious, came to me in the court of the prison. He was in prison. Man was in prison spiritually. According to the word of the Lord, and said, Buy my field, I pray thee. It's an Anathoth, in the country of Benjamin. That's a revelation of who's going to bring this forth. Because Benjamin means the son of the right hand. Who would that be? Jesus. For the right of inheritance is thine. There's a right of inheritance to be obtained. And the redemption, this is the word meaning a right of redemption, is thine. Otherwise, the right of inheritance, the right of redemption, these things had to be obtained. They had to be brought, they had to be acted upon. And so he knew this was the word of the Lord. He said, and he told him to buy it. And remember what Jesus was coming to do? To stop the evil and reverse the curse. So what do you think he paid for the land? I bought the field of Hannah Meal, my uncle's son that was in Anathoth, and weighed them the money, even 17 shekels of silver. He paid 17 shekels of silver, which was the price to end the evil and to reverse the curse on the land, which was what was going to happen when Jesus Christ would pay the redemptive price and do all the things that were necessary to bring forth what needed to be done to redeem man and to reclaim the earth. And we'll see that more as we go. So 17 is the number of the beginning and reversing of the curse and the ending of evil. Well, we see then at this point in time, the flood was done. If we go back to Genesis chapter 9 now, and he, made a, he began to deal with man with covenants. He establishes covenant with Noah here, but also you must understand all the covenants that were made were not just made with a man, whether it was Noah or Abraham or whoever. It was with the seed, and that's singular, meaning they all were made with the seed also, and the seed, which we'll jump ahead and show you who the seed is talking about in all these cases, Galatians 3, verse 16, this is speaking about the one to Abraham, Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Every one of these covenants were made to the seed, which is Christ. So, God begins to make covenants with man to deal with him. We come down to, of course, was man going to walk in God's ways? No, he's rebellious as ever. We come to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. One of the sons that Cush begat was Nimrod. And Nimrod means rebellion. He was rebellious against the ways of the Lord. And as a rebellious one, he began to establish his kingdoms. And the first kingdom was Babel, which means confusion by mixing. And that's the way the devil has always worked. He wants to bring a little bit of truth and bring lies and confuse by mixing. That's what he's been doing to man throughout. Confusion. And of course, we come down to chapter 11, and we see what they were going to do. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. That's becoming one. You know, the, the one world order is going to arise in these last days. The globalist movement is antichrist, you must know. You don't support the globalist movement. God set the nations. The globalist agenda 
of the UN and these ones in positions of authority in this government, unfortunately, is of the devil. It's Antichrist. And what did they want to do? They want to, of course, way back then. You come to verse, verse 3, they're going to make their brick. And they say in verse 4, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. A city speaks of government in Scripture. Tower speaks of religion. This is God, a government that was in rebellion to God and a religion that was against God, a false religion. And Satan's always liked religion as long as it's not the true religion. And so here he builds this up. They're wanting to build the city, Babel. So the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men, not the sons of God, this is the word sons, Bain, of men, so these are the guys that are in rebellion to God, were building and the Lord said, Behold, the people's one. They all have one language. As they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them, which they've imagined to do. And so he went down and confounded their language, and confused them, and sp spread them out and across the earth with all the different nations. God is the one who set the nations. He scattered them abroad upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city called Babel. This is the one world order agenda. And of course... Satan, being in a position of authority, he brought forth all the different kingdoms. He brought those this, this kingdoms, you know, that came forth one after another over time. And there's going to be one more that's going to come on the scene here at the end, unfortunately. It will be the new world order that will rise in these last days. It won't last long, that's for sure, because it's going to get destroyed. We come to chapter 12. God comes to Abram. He says, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, to a land that I will show thee. I'll make of thee a great nation, will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And then we come to verse 7. He says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded thee an altar unto the Lord. Otherwise, it wasn't just to Abram. Everything was made to Jesus, who was going to come and reclaim the earth. So, we go on down to chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And so Abram said back to the Lord, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. Well, we come to verse 4. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him to say, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. That means you're going to have a child that's going to be the heir. He proclaimed that. That was set. And of course, he said there, he brought him forth, looked down towards heaven, tell the stars if you be able to number them. He said to him, So shall thy seed be. Now, oh, that's really talking about not just his, but also. What's going to happen when Christ comes? He's going to bring forth the people who are going to be born again. He believed in the Lord and counted him for righteousness. And then we come to verse 7. He said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give this land to inherit it. And then Abram says something to him. He said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? How do I know I'm going to inherit this land that you say you're going to give to me? And God proceeded to make a covenant with him. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. How does God do everything? He does things through covenants, which means that he would perform it, but also man would have to perform it. But man couldn't perform these things, but the seed coming, who's Christ, would be able to perform it and accomplish what was necessary. Well, we come to chapter 16. Here he had this declaration, the fact that you're going to have a, an heir that's going to come out of your own bowels. You're going to have a child. Well, Sarah, she jumped the gun on things. Abram's wife bare him no child. She had a handmaid whose Egyptian's name was Hagar. And 
said to Abram, Behold, thou the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah, and what a mistake. And we have the Ishmaelites and the problems that we have today. Well, that didn't change what God had purposed. Chapter 17, Abram was 90 years old and nine. Now he's old. The Lord appeared to him, and Abram said to him, I am the Almighty God. He appeared to him as El Shaddai. This is the Almighty God that he manifested himself as. And then he said, Walk before me, and be thou perfect. And when he talks about walking before him, being perfect, this is a command to him. And this is talking about in the pale stem here, that he was to be walking continually before him. Uh, could he walk continually and be perfect? Uh, who's going to be able to do that? It's the seed that could do that. I'll make my covenant between me and thee and multiply thee succeedingly. Verse 4, as me behold my covenants with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And we come down to verse 7. And he says, I'll establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed. That's Christ. After thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant. And then the way into this covenant, which was pointing towards what was going to happen when Jesus came on the scene and accomplished everything. Verse 10, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after you. After thee, every man among you shall be circumcised. The circumcision of the flesh and the foreskin will be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Well, that's what it was in the Old Testament, in the flesh. But in the now, in the New Testament, it's not anything. We don't do anything in the flesh. It's circumcision in the spirit, where we get a brand new heart and a brand new spirit on the inside of us, and we get born again. Remember what it speaks of. We don't follow anything anymore of the physical and the natural in the Old Testament, because remember, Jesus fulfilled all these things. In fact, Romans 2.28, he's not a Jew, it's one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. He's a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. It's a spiritual circumcision. But that was pointing towards that, and that's fulfilled in the seed. Now, we go back to Genesis. One of the things you have to know in the covenant, the covenants that God makes, you have to obey the covenant to see the promises come to pass. Noah was righteous, did all that he commanded, was walking in obedience to him, and saw the covenant promise for him to be delivered from the situation and to be preserved. We see the same thing with Abram. He had to obey as well. Genesis 18, 19 says, I know him, talking about Abraham, he will command his children, his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice or what is righteousness and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Notice it's conditional. If you and I don't obey the word of the covenant, the covenant promises will not come to pass. He had to obey the word of the covenant to see the covenant promises come to pass. And he got tested. You and I are going to get tested as well. Genesis chapter 22. God did tempt or test, try and prove Abraham. He speaks to him. He says, Abraham, he says, here, behold, here am I. He says, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. This is the child that he said is the seed that's going to, have, that are going to be all, he's going to be a father of many nations. He'd already told them and this, the, the, all these promises to the seed. And here he's now, he's going to go up and he's going told that he's going to offer them for a burnt offering. He's going to be sacrificed. Well, Abraham had such confidence in God, he knew what would happen. Because look what he says in verse 5. Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the land lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. He said, If I offer him up there, he's going to raise him the dead, and we're going to come back. He had such confidence in God because he knew that this is the seed that he was to have continually. It was already a promise. So he goes up there, and 
Verse 8, in response to his son's question, Abraham said, My son God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together. They go up there. And now he comes to this place. He bound, binds Isaac, stretched forth his hand with a knife to slay him. And the angel of the Lord called to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. How does God know that you fear God? Because you obey him by your actions. How did he know that he feared God? Because of his obedience. Now I know that you fear God. You see, you have not withheld thy son, thine only son. He passed the test, didn't he? Because he did what God had told him to do. In doing so, of course, he lifted up his eyes and there was a, a, took a ram, offered him as a burnt offering instead of his son. And then we come down to verse 16, where he said, By myself by sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, which he fulfilled his covenant part. Well, there's another party to the covenant. Who's that? God. Which means because he gave his own son, now God could give his own son. This is required for God to be able to give his own son. They had to both do it. And he did it. That in blessing I'll bless thee, and multiplying I'll multiply thy seed, Christ. As the stars of the heaven, as the sand upon the seashore, and thy seed, Christ, shall so possess the gate of his enemies. That's right. He's going to come and conquer the enemies. And in thy seed, Christ, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Tremendous. But he accomplished. He had to obey to see this be able to come to pass, which was Jesus being able to come and be raised from the dead. We see this in Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it said, And Isaac shall thy seed be called, counting that God was able to raise him up. That's why it says we're coming back. Even from the dead, from whence he also received him, Jesus being raised from the dead in a figure. Praise God. He met the conditions for this that were necessary for Jesus to come and to be raised from the dead. There was a third covenant that he made with man. In Exodus chapter 34, in verse 10, speaking with Moses here, he says, Behold, I make a covenant before all, before all thy people I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among whom which thou art shall see the work of the Lord's a terrible thing that I will do with thee. That's a covenant. He's going to do miraculous works. He's going to perform. And verse 27, the Lord said to Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I made a covenant with thee and with Israel. He was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, and he did eat, neither eat bread nor drink water, and wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So here, we're talking about the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant that was made. Now, he had revealed to Moses, God had revealed to Moses before, back in Exodus 3.14, another aspect. Remember, he'd been revealed to Abram, Abraham as the name by El Shaddai, the mighty, almighty God. In verse 14, the God said unto Moses, I am that I am, or more literally, I am being that I am being. Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am, the I am being hath sent me unto you, when he asked about what name was that. And we come down to chapter 6, and there's a statement made in verse 3 that's important. He says, I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name of God Almighty. That's El Shaddai, the mighty God. But by my name Jehovah, which is the one that's the I am, the being that I am being, was I not known to them? He brought that later. You must understand the names of God are a revelation of who he is and what he does. And he was revealing, in this case, who he was. He's the covenant. This is the covenant-keeping name of the Lord because we see all the covenant names. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Ra'ah, Jehovah uh, Jireh. These are all the covenant-keeping names of the Lord of what he will do. And so he reveals this to him. 
And also we see that after when he made these, this covenant with him, in Exodus 19, verse 5, there's a prophecy. He said, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, and we do have to meet the conditions of it, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you'll speak on the children of Israel. This was a prophecy to all of the Jews, the Israelites. Could that be fulfilled in the Old Testament? No, because only one tribe was a priestly tribe, the tribe of Levi. Yet he says, you shall be, he's talking to all of them, a kingdom of priests. Well, you couldn't be a priest and a king in the Old Testament. You're one or the other. But a kingdom of priests, that means they would be priests and kings and a holy nation. This is all prophetic of what would happen through Jesus Christ, who is going to bring the fulfillment of this covenant and bring all these covenant promises into manifestation for all of us in the new covenant that he makes. There was a fourth covenant also that he made. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. When the days shall be, be fulfilled, you shall sleep with thy fathers. I'll set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I'll establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It's all talking about pointing towards Jesus. But of course, at that time, who was the one who followed David? It was Solomon. And Solomon made that temple, the second temple, remember? And that's a type of the church in which it's talking about the end time church that is going to be finished and dedicated and come to perfection. He's going to raise up. And so this is talking about the kingdom coming in the house. What kingdom? A spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of Jesus Christ that would come into manifestation. And also the spiritual house. Jesus is the one who did that. He's the cornerstone, remember, of the spiritual house of God. And you and I are the living, lively stones in the house of God that we come into when we are born again. So when these covenants are all pointing towards the work of God through Jesus Christ to bring forth the new birth, the circumcision and the spirit, the manifestation of the mighty God, the covenant keeping name with all the promises put in the law, pointing towards the law of Christ that now we're under in the New Testament, the temple pointing towards the real temple he's gonna to come to dwell in, which is us, the spiritual temple, also, there were the sacrifices that were put in, and you and I have spiritual sacrifices. Remember, everything we do in the New Testament, we don't do the natural. We do everything in the Spirit now. The spiritual sacrifices that we offer up unto God. He put all these things in. And so these covenants are pointing towards the work of Jesus Christ to come forth. And what was he going to do? He's going to come, and he was going to visit the people to bring forth what he purposed, which is to bring man, to redeem him and bring him out of the bondage to Satan and to accomplish all the things that were necessary to restore, recover the earth as well and to liberate man from all bondage and restore him back to the same place he was in before the fall. Luke 1, 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who hath visited and redeemed his people. Mm. Jesus was going to come and accomplish this. In order to do this, John 1, 14, as we saw, the Word, the second person of the Godhead, was made flesh. He had to become a man. The reason is because redemption had to be accomplished. Man had to be redeemed. He couldn't do it himself because he was under Satan's dominion and he was in spiritual death. It had to be someone who could offer himself, who would pay the price for sin. So the only person who could do it was God. But because man was involved in the fall, it had to be a man involved in the redemption. So that means God, who's the only one who could do it, had to become a man. That's why Jesus had to come. God had to become a man in order to accomplished the redemption. And so he had to become a kinsman redeemer, which we'll be talking about. The kinsman redeemer was one who would be a man and a kinsman to him who could get this right of redemption. And he didn't have the right of a redemption 
as far as being first in line, and you'll see that when we talk about Ruth, the redemption had to be passed on, the right of redemption to him, which it was, as you will see. And he also had to come and obtain the, the inheritance and take back the earth. And that's exactly what Jesus came, of course, one of the things that he came to do. He also had to come to deal with all the, all the sin. He had to be having the ability to sin, which he did. Look at Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. His spirit was right, but the flesh was sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, because he had to walk the walk that Adam had failed. Adam had failed, that's for sure. And look even what it speaks of calling him in 1 Corinthians 15, down in verse 45. First Adam was made a living soul, but the last Adam, that's the second Adam, that's Jesus. He was made a quickening spirit who was going to bring life unto mankind. Well, Jesus is the one, of course, he had to go through all the temptations. He was. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We have not a high priest which should not be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted in everything, and he passed the test. He had to pass every single test, and he did without sin. And what else did he do? He came to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, verse 8. Second part of the verse says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The word destroy actually is the word luo, which means to loose, to untie the works of the devil that had been done in man and in the earth. And he came to undo everything that the devil had accomplished and to destroy all of his works. When he came in his ministry, he came and he began to minister to bring the judgment upon Satan and the destruction of all of his works. He cast out all the devils. He healed the sick. He set the people free. He was destroying all the works of the enemy as he was ministering to the people, bringing forth this ministry for three and a half years, which is the fulfillment of the first half of Daniel's 70th week, which is important to know. There were 69 weeks, and when Messiah came afterwards, it said for three and a half years he ministered, and in the midst of that week he was cut off. He was the final sacrifice for sin after 69 and a half weeks. That final sacrifice was made when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. And what was he doing? He was coming to bring forth the reconciliation 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, or to know, that God was in Christ. Reconciling, and reconciling means the exchange. That brings us to another point. There was not only the right of redemption that he had to get, but he also the right of inheritance that he had to get but also the right of exchange of ownership that he had to get. And this is what this speaks of. We'll be talking about this as we go. To the exchange, reconciling, this accomplishing this exchange, the world unto himself. And notice, he's not imputing or charging their trespasses unto them. He's committed unto us the word of the exchange. Because that's what has to happen. What do we have to do? We have to get a new spirit. The exchange. The old spirit's got to go. The new spirit's got to come in. That's the exchange. New ownership. But Jesus had to do what was necessary to get the right of exchange. It's tremendous, the things that he accomplished, as you will see. Romans, chapter 5, verse 10. 
Or if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, the reconciliation, the exchange. Being much more being reconciled, this exchange having occurred, we shall be saved by His life. Now that tells you something. Salvation then begins, and it's an ongoing process in your life as you are continually working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, always obeying the covenant to see the promises be able to come to pass in your life. And not only so, we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received, taken hold of, the exchange. The word atonement is this word, again, kalalage, which means the exchange. The exchange that he has accomplished. We had to get this exchange. And, but Jesus had to come to the place to get this, be in this position to accomplish this. So, there were some important things. And as we saw, we'll look back again for a moment at Jeremiah. Some significant things had to happen. As Jeremiah bought this for 17 shekels, remember, the land, the right of redemption had to be obtained, and the right of inheritance had to be obtained. Also, the right for the exchange had to be obtained. We'll be looking at this later. This is the one where the one kinsman could not redeem Ruth. It would mar his own inheritance, and so he said, redeem my right. He gave his right of redemption. You'll see this when we talk about it later, to thyself. Otherwise, he passed the right of redemption on to him. Boaz was a type of Christ in order to get the right of redemption to accomplish the work. He said, I can't redeem it. And the manner in the Israel concerning redeeming, the right of redemption, but also concerning the changing, which is the exchange, the right to exchange for ownership. He had to get the right to exchange for the ownership, and you'll see that of how Jesus had to do all these things. Tremendous things that Jesus had to accomplish in order to accomplish everything that needed to be done. We also see the fact that he had to become the heir. He wasn't an heir. An inheritance only comes to those who succeed someone who has died. So somebody had to die. Who's coming to bring the redemption? Jesus, God in Christ. Who has to die? Has to God in Christ, Jesus, to pay the price? Well then, how does, if he dies, how does he become an heir? An heir is somebody else. Well, you gotta understand what needed to be done. We see in verse 16, when Jesus went to the cross, he made a New Testament in his blood. It hadn't come into manifestation yet, but he declared it. Oh, that's a new covenant. Where a testament is, he made a covenant. There must also of necessity be the death of the testator before it comes into power. Somebody had to die. He made a testament. That's a will. A testament is a force after men are dead. So the testament that he made, the New Testament, wasn't in force yet. It would only come in force after he's dead. But if he's dead, how can he be an heir? Well, something had to happen to him. He had to get a brand new spirit. He had to be born from spiritual death to spiritual life, which is exactly what happened. He died, he says, I was dead, and now I'm alive forevermore. He was the first begotten, born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. It's of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Well, Jesus, he did die. Remember what he says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18? I am he that liveth and was dead. He died spiritually separated from the Father on the cross, remember, 
The father left him, said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he was all the sins upon him. Behold, I am alive forevermore. What happened? He got a brand new spirit. He was the first born from spiritual death unto spiritual life. We know that from over in Hebrews chapter 1. When he bringeth in the first born, he's the first born into the world. The first born, because all men were spiritually dead. Jesus comes, he's not, but he has to get in that same state, becoming sin, and dies spiritually, separated for us. But because he never committed sin, he couldn't keep him in that situation. He got born again, the firstborn from the dead in hell. And he, now he's bringing the firstborn into the world. That's when Jesus came back and he got his physical body. We see it in verse 5. Which of the angels said at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, born thee. And again I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's right. After he got born from spiritual death and spiritual life, he was again a son, and the father was again now a father unto him. Jesus got the right of inheritance as the heir, because it says, Verse 2, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. He's the heir. He got the inheritance. He accomplished the redemption. And he did what was necessary, as you will see as we go through this. He got the exchange, the right of exchange, in order to accomplish the exchange of ownership so that you and I, could now be born again. Now we could be purchased and we now could be owned by the Lord. Praise God. He accomplished a great work. There was also a battle that went on. And we'll be talking about this. We're just throwing some of these things out for you today. In Luke 20, verse 9, where we saw that he let it out, this lease, the husband went to a far country for a time. God gave the least a man. And so he wanted to see what's the fruit of this vineyard. And the husbandman, which is man, who had, was now spiritually dead, separated and against the things of God, because he's run by the devil, spiritual father of the devil, beat him, sent him away. Oh, the prophets came and were trying to point him to the, well, all the things that they needed to hear, and they wouldn't listen to him. They just beat the prophets and killed them, didn't they? Send another servant, beat him, send him away. Send a third, wounded him, cast him out. Ah, the Lord of the vineyard says, I'll send my beloved son. They'll reverence him when they see him. And now Jesus comes. When the husband saw him, they reasoned among themselves, Ah, this is the heir. This is what the devils thought. This is the heir. If we kill him, we have the earth we have everything. We have it all. They didn't understand. This is a plan hidden in God. That's the exact opposite of what was going to happen. Because in killing him, going through the cross, remember, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. He is able to get to him that had the power of death and to take back the keys of hell and death, to accomplish the redemption paying the price, to get in a state of spiritual death so he could be the first one born from spiritual death unto spiritual life which he did, and get the right of exchange to so you and I could now be born again. He also could get to those ones in the upper compartment of Abraham's bosom to preach the gospel to all the Old Testament saints that were imprisoned, and so that they, the gospel was preached to them, so they'd be judged according to those that are living, so they got born again themselves, and they all came up out of there when he led captivity captive, and they got their bodies and were seen, remember? He brought them up out of there. Oh, they thought that it was all over. This is the heir. Let us come and let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. <laughs> nope. It was the opposite. This is the way that he was able to become and get the inheritance back from him. And he took back the keys of hell and of death. So they cast him out of the vineyard and they killed him. <laughs> Wherefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? They'll come and destroy these husbands, give the vineyard to others. Of course, what did Jesus come and do? 
in his first coming, he came and brought judgment upon the devil. That's what it's essentially saying in John chapter 16, verse 11. Remember, he came for three things, of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, sin, singular, and of judgment, it says, because the prince or the ruler of this world, not is judged, has been judged, declaring what was coming to pass, this judgment was coming on him, the reason is this is a perfect tense verb, which means completed action in the past, declaring what he was going to accomplish. This is all prophetic of what the Holy Spirit would be doing, convicting of sin, of not believing on Jesus, showing that he's the righteous one who went to heaven, and that the prince of this world, the ruler of the world, has been judged. That's right. His judgment's set. That's why he's finished. And all these evil spirits, they're finished. They know they're in trouble. That's why they're saying, you come to torment us before the time, they know their judgment's set. They know they're done. He's accomplished this great work. And this is all important for the end, not only for now, but you also have to understand, remember that he's buying that earth? And you'll see this when we talk about it later, but I'll just throw this out for you before we stop. In Revelation chapter 5. After the judgment that comes to the church in Revelation 2 and 3, which will come before the beginning of the tribulation, the reason, reason is because those who don't pass the test are going to be cast into great tribulation. Remember, Jezebel's cast in, her children are cast in. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 now, we see Jesus is about ready to bring the judgment on the nations at the end of the 6,000 years, which is nine years away. 4,000 years from the beginning to Christ, the four days. Two days is the church age, 30 A.D. it began. It ends at 20, 30 A.D. We're not done yet. We're nine years away, a little less than nine years away now to the end of the church age. Once that 6,000 years is done, that's the end of man's right to rule the earth. The lease is over. That's the end of Satan's right. You better believe that Jesus Christ is going to begin <clears throat> to exercise that authority and take back the earth by, first of all, kicking all those evil spirits out of the heavens. That's the first thing that's going to happen. Look what it says here. Revelation 12, 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. They're going to be kicked out and they're all coming down to earth. And it's going to be great havoc during that time. But for those who are walking with the Lord, they'll be protected. For those who don't walk with the Lord, it's going to be trouble. That's why you've got to be holy and righteous before him to be protected. Well, when he gets ready to open up this thing, remember that uh, thing, land he bought. And you'll see when we talk about that further, when he bought that, it was sealed as a title deed to that land. Well, it was done in advance for what Jesus would do when the time was at the end of the lease for the opening up of this title deed, which in fact is the title deed to the place in affliction, which is the earth. Here it is. Revelation 5.1, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. What kind of a book is written on inside and also on the backside and sealed? Title deeds. This is a title deed to the earth. And he's going to open the title deed to the earth to take it back. And all these seals are opened up as the judgments, as he's going to bring the judgment upon the nations who have rejected him. And those judgments are going to be rolled out in the time, in that three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. It's three and a half years, remember, not seven. Seven's a lie. It's this total deception. Because people have not understood Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. 
69 weeks, we're told he came. Half week, it was, it was three and a half years. There's only half week left, not seven years. Everybody says it's seven years, it's Daniel's 70th week. Well, 69 and a half weeks have elapsed. There's only one half week left, three and a half years. That's the time of the tribulation. You look in the book of Revelation, it's got sevens of everything, but there aren't any seven years. But there's three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months, times time and half a time, which are all three and a half years. This is coming. He's going to open up this. Th they were looking for someone who could open this up. Who's worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? There wasn't any man that could do it. Yeah, someone, only one person could be found worthy to do it. Aha, he said, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who conquered the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof and to begin the process of taking back the earth. That's what's going to happen. And at the end of this time, when Jesus comes to fulfill the final three feasts, Feast of Trumpets, catching up the church to meet the Lord in the air, rapture at the end, marriage supper in the Lamb in heaven for the ten days, then we come back, really the marriage is seven days, seven days long is what a marriage is, but the ten days periods in between. Then the seventh month, tenth day, the day of atonement, which is the day of judgment. That's why the high priest had to go in on that day and put the blood on the mercy seat or they would have been judged because that's the day of judgment that God set. And that's the day when the judgment will come on the nations. And five days later, later will be millennial reign of Jesus Christ, fulfillment of the tabernacles, and he will begin to rule and reign for a thousand years. And you and I, if we've met the conditions, will be given some place of rulership to rule and reign with him for the thousand years on the earth. After that's done, the earth's going to be burned up. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And then there'll be a brand new one. That, the new heavens and new earth will be one where only dwells righteousness. And then the Father will come because the new Jerusalem will come down and the Father's going to come and he's going, we're going to dwell with him and we will be with him and Jesus. It's a glorious time ahead. It's also a trying time ahead in the coming years. This is why you've got to put him first place in your life and walk in all of his ways and do what he says. Follow him to a T, 100%. Amen. Separate yourself from everything that is not of God and walk uprightly before him. Because remember, the covenant promises only are for those who are obedient. So you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and walk in his ways and we will see the rewards that will come and we will be with the Lord in the millennial reign of Jesus. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the great work that Jesus Christ has accomplished and will continue to accomplish to complete the total work of restoration, redemption, the inheritance, the exchange, the brand new heavens and new earth that will come to pass after his millennial reign. I thank you for this great work. Heavenly Father, we will walk in your ways. We will obey you in all things. We will work out our own salvation. And we thank you for the revelation in the word of God of this tremendous plan of redemption that you have accomplished through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. We will make sure that we are doing everything that you command us to do. So we will see the rewards that will come and we will be with the Lord in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ and with the Father in Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth dwelling with him through eternity. Thank you, Father. I am a hearer and a doer of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we all have ears to hear and understand the tremendous work that Jesus has accomplished. Thank you that we will make sure we walk in your ways and we will see the tremendous 
results of you accomplishing your work in our life. Thank you that we're going to go on to be per, per, into perfection, to be a part of this glorious end time church. Thank you for raising every one of us up to be in that glorious church. In Jesus' name, amen.